Hi, and welcome to this fourth session on literature reviews as part of the advanced research design course for master's students at UCT School of Education. Today, we're going to be having a look at what the literature review is, some different perspectives in the field about how to go about doing it and what kinds of expectations to impose on it, as well as just some more practical strategies about finding literature and a few little um, allegories and ideas for thinking about how to structure a synthetic analytic literature review that's not just a so-and-so said X, but so-and-so said Y. Okay, let's see how we go forward. Just to remind you in the last session, which was on conceptual frameworks, we looked at how reading around a particular topic or in a particular field of research in start to inform your nasal, uh, nascent conceptual framework. We talked about what is a conceptual framework as sort of a, a schema of concepts or ideas and how they relate to each other that helps you to see particular aspects of your um, data and in potentially also obscures others. We thought of it as a lens. We talked about what one can do in terms of bringing a theory into a conceptual framework that they're not quite the same, but often a conceptual framework is developed around or built upon um, an off the shelf theory or a big T theory, but that also in things like a grounded analysis type of study, you could start to formulate your own theory based on your analysis and the concepts and categories that emanate from the data. We also looked at how who you are and what you're trying to do can articulate with your conceptual framework. And we started to think a little bit about how you might operationalize your theory, take each concept and say, what will I do to actually observe this phenomenon or relation? What types of data do I need to produce? And how do I know that that data shows me the thing I think I'm seeing or observing? And how might it also be showing me something different? We'll chat about that again when we do validity in a couple of sessions time. But in this session, we are going to have a look at some papers that you needed to read for this lecture, which was a conversation between Boot and Beale, who wrote a particular paper about being scholars before being researchers. And then Maxwell responded to them and they responded back. We're gonna have a discussion about that conversation. And we'll focus particularly on the difference between a literature review of a field versus a literature review for a study located in that field. <clears throat> I'll also show you two little techniques that I personally found quite helpful for thinking about how to construct and sequence a literature review. They are not hard and fast, but I have found them to be nice little models or allegories that remind me about what it is I'm doing when I'm writing a literature review and how to go about taking what is a rich collection of interrelated areas of research empirical and conceptual, and trying to actually lay them out in a particular sequence or order, which is what you have to do when you construct the writing of it. So there's two little tools. There's a little fun allegory about thinking about uh, wedding guest lists and seating plans, and also a little visualization technique that I think is quite helpful for deciding about how to how much attention to pay to different aspects of the literature that you've analyzed and read and, and how to sharpen it down to that, which is, as Maxwell says, the most relevant for your research question. And then we'll also just briefly discuss some practical issues regarding conducting literature reviews and reading literature critically and carefully. Okay, Boot and Beale versus Maxwell. This was a little bit of a mudslinging interaction, but one that still raised nonetheless important points, even if sometimes the tone of each paper was uh, a little bit uh, saucy, shall we say. Boot and Beale wrote an original paper in 2005 where they made the argument that students, particularly doctoral students, but remember this is a United States publication, so they're talking about a much longer five-year doctoral program than the South African program, in the, in the States, effectively a master's and a PhD are bundled together. So you'll do coursework at the beginning of your PhD for about two years, and then you'll do three years of writing up your 
research and dissertation, we break those two phases apart and call the first one the master's and the second one the PhD. So they're saying that PhD students, doctoral students are not demonstrating sufficient mastery of the field in their theses. And they argue that literature review can be a contribution in and of its own right, and that it is important that doctoral programs are structured in such a way as to apprentice and teach students what a literature review is, why it is a valid piece of their development as, as researchers and scholars, that it is not just sort of background reading to support um, a methodology or a set of findings, and that it needs to be, in their words, thorough and sophisticated. They go about saying how experienced researchers conduct um, lit reviews and combing literature for, combing a, a canon of literature for the relevant papers and, and uh, studies to cite and, and examine. Um, one of the things that I think is quite interesting is that they say that, you know, students depend more on, say, uh, database searches, whereas more experienced scholars tend to identify personal networks as a means of uh, picking up relevant research, which I think is kind of interesting given that that's not something that students are actually able to do given where they are at their stage of development. But nonetheless, they point out the distinction that someone with a deep understanding of a field knows that it's more about conversations between people participating in that field versus just a Google Scholar or um, another database kind of search. I'm trying to think of some of the databases that um, UCT Library has. There's local South African ones and other ones. <clears throat> Nonetheless, that's what students do. And they argue that a literature review both contributes to theorizing and conceptualizing of the research, as well as demonstrating uh, advanced prowess and familiarity with the field. They do, however, state that very clearly there's a lot of variation in how researchers think about re literature reviews, what they believe is the role of a literature review, and hence the criteria applied to literature reviews by examiners, by supervisors, etc., is deeply varied. And they constructed a rubric which they um, used to evaluate 30 different literature reviews in published and accepted theses and gave us a sense of where the criteria that they thought mattered were lacking or not being developed fully for students. Now Maxwell responded and said, yes, you're right we're not paying enough attention to the literature review as a formative step in a student's development and as a piece of the product that they are embarking on that needs to be taken seriously and needs to not just be marginalized or glossed over. But then he lifts out a distinction that he thinks Boot and Beale don't make. He distinguishes between a literature review for and a literature review of. Now, in publications, particularly in journals that say review of educational philosophy or review of economics and education, these are journals that tend to publish actual research articles that are literature reviews as a piece of research. Um, they're often called a metasynthesis or a synthesis of X, Y, Z. And these are incredibly useful articles to find in your field if you can, because someone else has gone to all the trouble of literally reading almost everything that can be read about a particular topic and synthesizing it and analyzing it critically and summarizing the, the conversations that are happening. Sort of like if you've got a really long backlog of a, a very famous series that's been running for many, many years, and then you can go to the sort of Wikipedia page and someone summarized all the episodes and the plot lines and the characters for you. Very useful. But that's a literature review of, and it has particular criteria regarding how thorough it needs to be. A literature review for, on the other hand, is setting up the terrain against which a particular study is located. 
Um, and that is what a student writing a thesis is doing. Maxwell argues that the literature review needs to be in a dynamic conversation with the whole research design, that it is a tool that a student needs to learn how to use to locate what they're doing, ground their conceptual claims and definitions in ones that have already been established in the field, even if that is in antagonism to the field. For example, people in my field have defined teacher beliefs as A, B, C, but I think that there is a missing gap because they don't mention D and I'm going to investigate D, but it's a tool. It's a tool whereby you sharpen your concepts, you locate your research, and you show how what you're doing is in conversation with texts that are relevant to your question. And relevance, which is one of Maxwell's key concepts in his paper, is he says the most difficult to grasp, but also the most foundational. It is the, the ability to pick up a paper and say, is this relevant to my study or not? That is the skill that you need to acquire when you are practicing literature reviews in both your master's and your PhD. And how you adjudicate relevance comes with a more and more nuance and subtlety as you become more and more familiar with your field and what is being said and done in your field. I quite like Maxwell's metaphor where he says that a good literature review for a study is an anchor. It connects and studies the study or thesis. But unlike an anchor, unlike a foundation, an anchor can be constructed with or even after a particular piece of work is conducted. Now, literature reviews are funny things. Um, you don't do them once. In fact, you normally do them two or three times. The first time is when you're just reading and scanning broadly and trying to figure out what is this field about and, and what about it interests me. The next one is when you do a proposal where you demonstrate that the idea you wish to pursue is located in the literature in a particular and strategic way. But then once you've done all your data production, once you've done all your analysis, once you've gone out into the field, and you've written everything up using your concepts, going through your data, synthesizing, what you think are the key takeaways, you then rewrite your literature review. Because what you find from your analysis may point out that, you know what, you thought that teacher beliefs was the thing that you were looking at, but actually what you were really looking at was how context shapes beliefs. You've got to go back to your literature review and rewrite it according to what your data production showed you. So you don't do a literature review once, you often do it even more than twice but you certainly do it at least before you go into your research design and methodology and you go into data production and you do it again at the end. I thought that Maxwell also made a very powerful, if somewhat understated critique of Boot and Bill that their own literature review for their paper didn't do what they said it should do. And it wasn't doing what he said it should do either, namely set up the problematic that the paper is investigating. And he pulls out particular examples where they were citing literature that they made no relation to regarding the problem that they were looking at themselves. They just said, so-and-so said X, Y, and Z. And he's like, how does that relate to what you're doing here? I thought that that was uh, uh, quite a neat one too. Now, for my own part, I found Maxwell's argument more persuasive than Boot and Beale's. <clears throat> and I think that there's some critiques of the Boot and Beale paper that warrant being pulled out and examined. Um, the first, at least for me, that struck me was how there was this idea of thoroughness and, and sort of a totalizing coverage of a particular field that ignores how much literature has proliferated um, with a much stronger drive towards publication and a much higher access to a much broader set of literature based on digital technology. Now, part of keeping the lid on how much you need to review involves making fields more specialized so that you can contain that rapid expansion. Um, and it also involves 
Maxwell's criteria of relevance. But this idea that students should be able to demonstrate that they have pretty much read everything in their field is quite an old idea that comes from the 50s and 60s, where there was only so much to read. And mastery and knowledge of that field in a totalizing manner was much more feasible. So for me, that was a little bit of like a, you know, you know that like things have kind of exploded in volume recently. There is also a sense from their paper about gatekeeping, um, premised on exclusion and the reproduction of a very conservative ideal of academia. So they even said gatekeeping and policing on page six. So they want the literature review to be held to a higher standard and they set up what they think that standard should involve because they feel like students are entering into the state of having a doctorate without having ticked what they think are certain key indicators of being considered a peer of faculty or achieving this capstone qualification. And that does kind of point to a desire to sort of stand on the mountaintop and not allow other people to join you there, um, which always makes me kind of question the politics behind the argument that's being made, which unfortunately in this particular paper, there was, there was no engagement with changes in academia as a practice, the broader political, economic and social conditions under which research is being done, namely things like cyber technology, deeper globalization, et cetera, et cetera, or some of the critiques of academia as being elitist and normatively aligned with certain cultural and um, political ideas that are excluding other forms of scholarship because they can, rather than because of the quality of the scholarship or the types of knowledge that's being produced. So that kind of made me feel a little bit like, mm, okay, not sure that that's what a literature review should be used as, like a sort of ax to cut off people's access to the, the academy. They use the word sophisticated, which is a very normative term, a lot, but I don't think that it's well-defined to be honest. And I felt that their rebuttal of Maxwell caricatured his, his response to them. So for example, they state he never provided a definition of foundationalism, but it is provided in his critique. Um, they said that Maxwell wrote that a research thesis should emulate research articles, but I couldn't find any evidence in his text that he said that. So one got a sense that they, their response to his critique was a little bit defensive and, and not very clear and um, argued consistently. So, <laughs> you know, that's where it kind of gets a little bit polemic um, rather than a more kind of considered discussion of what each person said. But they do make some important points and, you know, we shouldn't dismiss everything they say because of the way they say it or that we disagree with some of the points. Uh, they do offer very useful insights about a literature review needs to be a synthesis. It needs to be a critical analysis of a body of research relating to a particular topic. It's not just, well, according to so-and-so, blah, 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 but according to so-and-so, blah, 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 which I do see a lot. And Maxwell says he sees it a lot too. And I even see it with, um, you know, experienced senior researchers who are in faculty where it's more just a descriptive, as if you're relating the local neighborhood gossip rather than saying, well, here are the different arguments being made. Here are the strengths and weaknesses of each and here's how they interact. And here's where I sit and here's something no one's talking about. So synthesis and critical analysis of the text is definitely missing from a lot of literature reviews. And it's a skill that needs to be developed and learned in practice in literature review writing, even literature review four. They also raise important things about mastery of a field to speak with and critique with an epistemic warrant. So you do need to convince your reader that they should trust what you have to tell them. And part of that convincing is by demonstrating that you have engaged with the arguments and ideas that are already made. So you want to kind of, you want your readers to kind of go, I kind of trust what this person is saying. I'm convinced they know what they're talking about because they seem to have really read carefully and deeply into this topic.
They also relate to, they also uh, talk about, sorry, from my previous point, another important aspect of literature reviews, which is an important aspect of research in general, it's not specific to literature reviews, and that is rhetorical style. Now, writing academia and writing research can be incredibly dry, but it doesn't have to be. And it also doesn't have to be this kind of, and then Bruton Beale said this, and then Maxwell said that, but according to Boot and Beale, I, it, you, there is a rhetorical style that is about engaging a reader and conveying information in an engaging way that is pleasant to read, clear, and lays out your arguments in a concise and logical manner. Again, it is a skill. It is something one has to practice. It is one somewhat, th it is something one has to notice as a skill and explicitly look for. And a lot of students are not given the training or opportunity to develop that skill. And they also point out that the literature review must, as we discussed in previous um, sessions together, it's not just about people's findings. It's not just about content. It's also about engaging with how they did it. Is that trustworthy? How do they design the research that is the basis upon which they're making these claims, what is their methodology? So you're not just looking at what someone said, but you're looking at how they went about saying it. In education policy, which is my field, one of the common um, sets of kind of tensions is between what we call school effectiveness approaches and school improvement approaches, which bring quite different ontologies about how one starts to understand what happens in schools. And you'll find that these two groups of people often just talk past each other because their ontological and epistemological groundings about what they're saying are fundamentally different. Now, as a person who knows the research and the literature in my own field, I'm familiar with that division and I'm familiar with the tensions it produces, but you only get that when you really start to know your research area and the literature in there well. So don't just look at the content, look at how the content was produced. Okay, what you are engaging with in this master's dissertation and this research proposal that you are preparing is a literature review for, not of. And that means that you need to be able to identify, as Maxwell said, what is relevant to your research question. And of course it's dialectic. So as you read more and more, your research question will get sharper, but then it will change what you read and it slowly um, converges. But you also need to have a sense about how to do a synthetic kind of literature review because it's gonna be far more than you can write about. So I'm gonna to present to you two little models that I think are fun to, to think with about how one goes about structuring and, and approaching writing a literature review. So an allegory, if you're not aware, is a kind of drawn out metaphor. It's where you tell a story like a parable um, in order to make a point that's about something completely different, but it's the, schemas or themes that run through the allegory that apply to the object of interest. So my little allegory is about a wedding. And it's about the idea of the task, there's two tasks, who are you gonna invite, namely a guest list, and how are you gonna seat them in the venue? So a seating plan. And think through in your mind, if you were organizing someone's wedding, what kinds of criteria you would use? You can't invite everybody. You probably need to think about who are the closest to the couple who are getting married and how are they represented? You might use different criteria to decide what being close to the couple means. It might be traditional, like the family. It might be less traditional, depending on who the couple are and, and, and who they say, like they, how they want their wedding organized. <clears throat> And when you're sitting about thinking about how you're going to seat everybody and, and locate them in a, in a fixed venue, you think about who knows who. So kind of how do, how do different people cluster into little sub networks? You think about who really disagrees or detests who and kind of say, well, they clearly don't sit at the same table. Uh, how many tables? What kind of space is available? Practical stuff. But the point is that it's an intimate knowledge about 
who are the potential invitees versus who you're going to select and how you're going to arrange them. And you need to have a sense of the couple's social network, their history, tensions, grouping, synergies, et cetera, okay? to do it well. Now visualize this, okay? If this is the orange square is your room, you might put the one person's family on the one side and the other person's family on the other side. You might have some distant family who have flown in from I don't know where, who um, will probably not be quite as close to the couple's table, but they'll be with the family that they know, sort of second or third removed connections. You might have close childhood friends or university friends um, on the one side, and maybe they know each other because this couple met at university. Maybe they don't. You might have some work colleagues. I mean, what if this couple met at work? Then you probably only have one table because all the work colleagues would know each other. But if they work in two different places, you might have two. You might have a whole bunch of misfits, sort of random people that don't seem to fit into any of the other groupings. It's a schema. It's a schema to stimulate your imagination. But the most important point is that it's who the couple are and the, and the structure of their social relations that is going to affect how you go about this arrangement. The same idea applies to a literature review form. You've got your research question. And you'll have very similar studies, maybe from two fields, if you're working at the intersection of fields, that will be closest to your research question. And you will say, well, in this paragraph, I'm going to talk about these, this group of research that is maybe particularly located in the same country or in the same sort of geopolitical conditions. And I'm gonna talk about these guys who are located in the global north or in a different set of geopolitical conditions. But I'm also gonna have a paragraph here that says, other people have gone about studying this in the way that I'm going to as well. And this is how it relates to the concepts I'm interested in. So you might have a section on the studies that are methodologically relevant, even if they're studying something of a little bit of a different topic. You might have ones that are conceptually relevant. You might have some that are like distant family, somewhat similar, but a little bit more removed. You might have some context setting studies. You might have some hard to categorize studies that don't really fit into any of the other groupings, but they shine interesting uh, light on, on some of the, the research question. And you feel like what they do is they illuminate for your readers some of the subtleties that you're trying to express. These might be they might be some of the groupings that you might use to structure a literature review. Okay, let's look at an example. Teacher beliefs about maths, language, teaching and learning. You might have some literature about teachers' beliefs about maths and multilingual context. And you find some great papers about teachers' beliefs about language and how it relates to pedagogy. And you can see that the group on the right are not engaging with the maths question at all. The group on the left are not really engaging with sort of language and its relation to pedagogy necessarily, it's outside of mathematics. And these are the groups of, of studies that one will be more thorough about. And when you're doing an analysis and a synthesis in the literature review, you're going to, you're going to discuss a little bit more of the detail in these studies. Now you might find some literature about how to research beliefs. Or you might find some literature about beliefs and their role in education. You'll want to kind of set that up too. It's more like a background for some of the other stuff that you discuss in more detail, but you're not going to go into quite so much detail with them. You're going to set up the terrain, okay, and sketch the relevant debates in quite broad terms. You might find some studies with beliefs about maths, which are not about education at all, but they're actually from the maths department. But you might sort of say, you know, the way that maths and teaching are understood in the education literature is echoed by or refuted by some of this other literature that occurs from the maths literature. You might talk about the role of teacher practice in South African education and just very generally search some contextual stuff, although that might go into a different section as well. Okay, so you can start to see how the closer to the research question the topics are, the research is, the literature that you find is, the more detail you're going to go into about what this tells you 
about what's already been done and the kinds of conversations that you're inserting yourself into. Here's another example. Rhythms and time, space in school. Yes, I'm using my own theses, but this, they're the ones I know best. And I, I think that at least that means that the, the examples are, are grounded in a deep knowledge of these two literature reviews. So rhythms and time, space in schools and the role of timetables. I couldn't find anybody who'd researched schooling timetables. So all of a sudden I'm going with my literature review, I'm going, oh, okay, um, now what do I do? Because I need to show that I've engaged with stuff that matters here, but it's a very, it's a very nascent field that's very underdeveloped. Okay, I found studies on school rhythms, which was how I was looking at timetables. So I had a concept of rhythm that was my lens for thinking about timetables. Okay, let me look for rhythms. And there were only two or three of those and they weren't related to schools. They were more about universities or adult education centers. So my literature review close to my question was very, very thin. And dragging the table called rhythm into the wedding venue of my research question was a new contribution. So bringing a conceptual concept from geography and bringing it into education, kind of going, oh, we could use this to think about schools. So that's when you drag into the wedding venue something very unexpected and unorthodox. Here's a wedding table for all of the ex tinder dates of the couple. They said they wanted them to come along and have a gloat. I mean, I'm making a joke, but you get my point. It's a pretty unorthodox table to have at a wedding venue. Okay. So I had to expand thinking about what kinds of literature I could look at to help me get a grasp on the concepts I needed to study rhythms of time space in schools and their relation to timetables. So I looked at literature about time in schools and there were three distinct areas. Uh, there was about time on task. So, you know, how less in time is spent and, and how much of that is focused on pedagogical activity. There was about school organization and structuring, particularly pacing and curriculum design. So how much work are students expected to learn in what unit of time at each grade level and in each subject? There's quite a lot of stuff on that. And then there was some about looking at absence from school. So student absence and teacher absence and the socioeconomic conditions and rationales for why some schools experience high level absence compared to others. And these were all about time in schools, but you can see they're quite distinct areas of literature. I then also looked at literature about space in schools. And again, at least three distinct areas of literature came through. There was about how schools are architected. So the design and provision of space, how big are classrooms, how, how's the staff room structured to enable work, et cetera, et cetera. There were empirical studies about how space is used in, in terms of how that was planned or unplanned in schools. And then there was space at a broader scale. So there was um, sp spatial studies about how students move to and from schools, scholar transport, catchment areas, et cetera. Mark Hunter, for example, has done some interesting work there. Um, and that introduced the concept of scale, which was very useful when thinking about my own studies. So from the space literature, I got scale. <clears throat> I then did a little bit of dipping toes into literature about what is time and how it relates to institutional organization, particularly education institution organization, because I noticed a gap in the literature about time in schools, which was that they were all premised on clock time. They were all premised on a social construct of time as what we read by clocks, whereas actually there is a lot more to time than just that. And so I looked a little bit more into the theory of time and that was very useful for framing my study. So this is an example where the, the literature very close to the research question was way too thin. But then as soon as I kind of said, all right, well, how do I open this up a little bit and look at some other literature, it got very, very wide very, very quickly. It was quite hard to hold down. OK, and that can happen. Remember, you will read a lot more than you will use in a literature review. What I like about this allegory is it starts you thinking about who's in conversation with whom. For example, you might have, like I said, if, you, if I was organizing a wedding where I would invite all the scholars who were writing on the topic I was interested in, or I was organizing a conference perhaps, there are people who 
would sit together because they bring particular foci, particular lenses, particular conceptual approaches to their research. And if I just told everybody, sit anywhere you like, they'd all sit together because they, they, they're having conversations already. The school effectiveness folks who then use different approaches, a sort of intervention, inputs, outputs, can we measure a difference? They might use more quantitative methods. They probably all sit together. So think about when you're reading, if you invited all these people into a conference venue and said, uh, sit anywhere you like, how would they naturally cluster? Okay. But your venue is limited in space. And I certainly could not, for example, in a lit one literature review that was meant to be a literature review for a study about rhythms and time, space and timetables, I could not include everything that's been written on all these topics, not at all. So how do you go about taming that beast? How do we curb a literature review's capacity to grow? This is another little tool that I think is useful. It's not the only one, take it or leave it, see if it works for you. But if you're operating at the intersection of different areas of thinking, and your research question is sitting at the middle of the intersection of those areas of thinking, here's one way to think about how you could structure the literature review and know how much attention to, attention to pay to different sections, okay? You start with those that are closest to your study. And then you go, and we'll talk about later about how you identify related studies, et cetera, that are relevant. But then you go out to things that are a little bit further away, like I moved from rhythms to time or rhythms to space. And you might look at, for example, research that sits in the area that intersects between A and C, but not B. From there, you might say, well, A and C, there are these people talking about that interaction. A and B, there is a different group of people talking about that one. You might move there next. So you, you go from the intersection at the middle, which is the most closest to what you're doing, and you move out to the intersections of two circles that emit one, which are going to be a little bit less close, but aren't just like the whole field of each area. Then you might step into one or two of the big fields. But the thickness of the arrow indicates how much uh, importance and relevance you're going to attach to those studies in terms of the, the attention um, you spend to them and how much detail you relate in your literature review. So you identify literature from the center outwards but you write in the opposite order. You write from outside in towards your research question. So the thicker arrow means a more detailed discussion and analysis. So you might say, well, there's this area called B. Here are a few of the key things happening there. Um, but there's also this area called C, and guess what? They interact in a particular way. But C also interacts with A, A with B, but really I'm interested in all three. And you can actually plot and go which pieces of literature that I have identified fits into which area and how much attention and time should I spend on them. Let's look at an example. Non-formal education, a huge body of literature. One that you would very much struggle to be thorough in Boot and Beale's terms, okay? It's huge. Immigrant socialization in urban spaces, also huge body of literature on immigrant studies, and particularly immigrants to urban spaces. Feminized work in, in a semi-formal economy in South Africa, probably not quite as big, but still, like you'll find sort of sociology and economics and anthropology and critical geography and, 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 okay? A research question about non-formal education in immigrant hair salons in Cape Town. Yes, Dan Moore, I'm using yours. <laughs> because I think it's a really nice illustrative example, hope you don't mind, would sit at the center of these. You might start with a discussion of non-formal education and some of the broad contours of conversation in that field, because this is an education, education thesis. So you wouldn't start with immigrant studies because you're not working in the sociology department. And you wouldn't start with semi-formal economics in South Africa 
because you're not in the economics department. So you'd probably start with non-formal education because it's an education thesis. So you're setting the tone at the beginning of your literature review that this is the, this is the, the terrain that we're standing on here. But you might say, okay, what about non-formal education for people working in, in feminized, semi-formal economic conditions? Who's written about that? And then you might say, okay, who's written about non-formal education for immigrants, particularly immigrants in urban spaces? Who's written about that? Then you go to the heart and say, well, here's six studies I found that talk about something very similar to mine. But here's what they don't say. So I'm gonna say it. Here's how they understand non-formal education. I'm gonna bring a subtle definition that's different to non-formal education because I think that non-formal education for immigrants is not going to fit with the given definitions in the literature. Or you might go, in my study, the other studies that are close to mine, think of immigrants in a particular way and they don't count about how being a woman shapes the immigrant experience for example. So you can see how you can plot your moves. You can plot your moves about your literature review from the broad to the narrow to set up your research question in the context and the conversation that you are stepping into. And you take your reader on a journey through your literature review to say, broad brushstrokes, broad brushstrokes, focus, 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 focus. This is what we're looking at. Good writing particularly for a literature review, is not just, well, according to so-and-so X, Y, Z, but according to so-and-so A, B, C. It's not only just dry. You are not doing exactly what Booth and Beale said should happen, which is synthesizing and critically analyzing the literature that you've read. And so good writing of a literature review is that each paragraph you plan, what am I telling the reader in this paragraph? How does it relate to the previous ones? How is it setting up what's coming next? And you take your argument forward and you take the reader with you. And so what I quite like about this little schema is it helps you to think about the steps you're going to take and the moves you're going to make in terms of developing the rationality of the argument about why this literature matters and what conversation you are contributing to. This is just a guide, all right? It is not hard and fast. It's just meant to get you thinking a little bit more rigorously about your literature review structure, your moves and your sequences and how you will take what is non-linear. There's absolutely no linear relationship about first this, then that between these three different foci of research. But unfortunately, when you're writing, you need to step, you need to sequence it. Writing is linear. There's a start and an end. And so you need to decide the order in which you will present information. And that noticing that order and how it builds on what has come before is part of the writing skills, the rhetorical skills that Boot and Beale noticed are not present in a lot of literature reviews. Finally, you're doing all this, but there are some practical aspects as well to conducting good literature reviews. Firstly, not all literature is equally weighty, all right? So, for example, peer-reviewed publications are far more robust and respected than grey literature. Uh, any work that has clearly been subject to a rigorous review process by independent, preferably blind reviewers, is always going to have been just stress-tested a little bit more than information that hasn't. So that means that, for example, I've seen this quite a lot with master students where they'll treat something like an, a report from an NGO as hard and fast truth. And as much as I, I love the people at Equal Education, it's not subject to peer review. And there are times that those reports, although they look very impressive and have um, glossy print and, and convey authority and how they're presented, have got some things quite wrong. So that's not to say that it gets everything wrong and there's, there's some useful stuff there, but you can't treat gray literature with the same gravity as stuff that's actually been peer reviewed and stress tested. Watch out for dodgy journals. Unfortunately, the more academics are under pressure to publish, the more 
journals that are either explicitly predatory or operating in a little bit of a gray area are proliferating to meet the demand for publication space. So if the quality of the editing looks a bit suspect, or the article is making strong unfounded claims, which have not been challenged by a, an editor or a reviewer, just take a cautious stance, okay? Um, there are some journals, for example, that will take your entire PhD thesis and just publish it unedited. That's not good scholarly practice. The point is that we rigorously engage and robustly interrogate each other's work and that makes our work better. So plus just by sense. Okay, that's not to say as well that there aren't questionable, questionable things stated in supposedly respected journals. I mean, that happens too. Uh, generalizations about the Global South is a good example, okay? By people who are clearly not deeply familiar with the context that they are writing about. Trust your intuition. If something seems a bit dicey, what a curious researcher and scholar goes and does is goes, I don't, I don't, I don't does that sound right? I'm sure that sounds right. Well, that sounds very strong. Wow, that sounds very bold. Let me go and see if I can find something else to back that up. Can I go and find something that critiques or problematizes this or, or casts some more light on the context? Has someone else responded to this? We'll talk a bit more about like tracking authors and conversations a little bit. If you want to source something from a, a personal website or a blog or a text that's not been peer reviewed or checked, um, even if it's something like YouTube or a TED talk, TED Talks guys are not, they're not rigorous, they're not robust, okay? Do a little digging. Do a little digging yourself to see if you can find empirical data or assertions or findings that, that seem to check and track or not, as the case may be. Uh, newspaper articles, popular cultural resources like YouTube, etc. they are usable, TED Talks are usable, but you need to frame them as what they are. You can't say according to X, where X has been writing in peer reviewed journals on this for 20 years and is a respected scholar in their field, but according to Y, where Y is a, uh, a vlogger on YouTube. They're not sitting on parity in terms of knowledge claims, unless the vlogger on YouTube is the expert who's been writing on this for 20 years. Well, then you're in better territory. And always try and go to a primary source if you can. So if a vlogger is saying on YouTube, blah, 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 I found this regarding um, teachers and classrooms, etc., go and find the sources. Go, go check their sources. A decent person who has done their homework and is making claims based on, on proper research will tell you their sources. Go to the primary source if you can. More on practical aspects. Again, I'll repeat, because this is something people struggle, you're not going to use everything you read. You should expect this. Don't try and cite everything you read in your literature review. You need to be more nuanced. You need to be more selective based on the argument you're constructing and the synthesis that you are sketching for your reader. It's not a flex as to how much you've read. Even though sometimes when you read the boot and bill, you might think that that's what they want you to do. That's not what it is, okay? The more you read, the more your ideas and thinking refine and sharpen. And actually you may even abandon prior approaches or lines of inquiry, especially pre and post data production and analysis. If you're trying to do a search based on a concept or a word that is key to your ideas or key to your research question, you need to notice like search terms that others have used. So, um, uh, if you're searching for the concept rhythm, others might have used the word routine. If you're searching for the concept uh, beliefs, you might find other people have used the word dispositions or mental schemas or attitudes. And then you start to notice that the, the, the definition between beliefs and attitudes is slightly different. So then you start to scratch away at that and see if you can get a little bit more sharpened on it. But notice how somebody might have talked about something very relevant to what you're doing, but they've used a different word for it. And you need to include those words in your search terms. Try and enjoy the reading and discovery if you can. Try and really adopt a curious disposition. Can I, I think what you mean by belief and what you mean by belief are not the same thing. Scratch, 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 scratch. Try and enjoy that, it's quite fun. I know that it's time consuming, but it's really fun. 
uh, keep an Excel spreadsheet of your readings or choose early a citation manager app. Uh, with Mendeley, EndNote, Zotero, I personally like Citavi, um, which is less known in South Africa, but I find it very elegant and clean. But whatever works for you, try to start with it from the beginning. It will save you a lot of heartache later when you literally have 200 papers and you're wondering which ones have I read, which ones am I using? Can't remember which ones do I want to quote from. Start, start a management strategy early. There's a whole lot of stuff on the UCT library website about uh, UCT licenses for Mendeley and students who can download that for free, et cetera, et cetera. So have a look, watch some YouTube videos about the different systems, what they offer, what they don't, which ones are free, which one are paid, et cetera, and make a decision for yourself. But I recommend you pick one early and you work with it. Notice when the material that you find that resonates with your approach, that resonates with your question, that resonates with your field is coming from the same journal again and again and again, because that's going to be a very useful way to make sure that you haven't missed anything important. You can then go to that journal's website. You can then back comb through the catalogs and literally read the topics for each edition and each volume and issue number and, and check through and see, is there anything else in this journal that's relevant to what I'm doing? So that will show you where people are going to have conversations relevant to what you're talking about. But probably the most powerful way of all of discovering more literature based on what you found is citation lists. So take an article that is really close to what you're looking at and who do they cite? You'll eventually start to develop the skills where you can differentiate between citations that are about conceptual grounding, citations that are about historically locating, a broad concept like non-formal education versus citations that are really like, but these are the guys I'm talking to here. You'll also start to notice that there are key influential publications in your field. We'll talk about how to identify those as well. So the bibliography of an article goes backwards in time. It can only cite research that was published before it was. So how do you look forward in time to how this this article has been cited by others. Quite a useful thing to do there is uh, Google Scholar. So you look up the article in Google Scholar and you'll see at the bottom there are little links that says cited by, and it'll give you a number. And you can actually click on that and it will give you a list of all the other journal articles, at least the ones that Google has scraped up, that then cite that. So you can then look forward. Okay, I can see who you cited, but who cited you? And then you can start to pick up threads of conversations that way as well. Citation numbers are that key for finding a very influential text. So you'll see that, for example, some of the Maxwell texts that I've been giving you in this course have got over 40,000 citations. That's huge. Now you know that this is a highly used text, that people like it and are using it and are asking other people to use it, okay? That's also uh, something that Google Scholar is really useful for. But don't just use Google Scholar. Learn how to use Sabinet and other databases from your library as well, because Google Scholar doesn't have everything. I know we like to think that the Google overlords have everything, but they don't. So learn how to use your library's databases as well. And when you do use Google Scholar and you sort of ask for the little citation text that you want to copy paste, careful. Often the citation text on Google Scholar is incomplete or inaccurate. So either I mean, I'm an old school person. I like to do my citations by hand, but that's just me. Your uh, citation manager app will produce different formats of citations. We use APA in the School of Education at UCT, but different journals have different citation structures and formats. Just careful when you trust the Google Scholar citation text is often not complete. One of the other things that you can do when you're trying to pick up on conversations and threads and relevant research is once you identify an author who's clearly working in a field very similar to yours is you can then also go and look at their Google Scholar profile or their um, academia.edu profile. There are a few of them, ResearchGate is another one where you can see what is this, what, what, what else has this person published? Um, and you can go and see through whether they've written something else also on this topic that's useful for you. So you can track by journal, you can track by citation network, you can track by author, um, you can track by keywords and search terms and related keywords and search terms. These are all ways of discovering more literature that may be relevant to your question. Okay, that's what we're gonna cover in literature reviews for today. 
I have a little task that I want you to do for the next session, please. I want you to use your emerging conceptual framework to create a literature map. I, I had the little Venn diagram, um, or you can try and use the, the sort of venue allegory. But start to kind of try and chart and map what you found and how it relates to the concepts in your question. How might you group the readings according to methods, perspectives, conceptual framings, uh, geopolitical foci? And, and see if you can articulate a gap in what you've read so far, which you'll then go and see if you can fill or not as the case may be. And then the other thing I'd like you to do is there's a little template for session five, one A4 page that I've put on Vula that I would like you to fill in to describe where you are at with your thinking right now with your research design and your proposal going to really advocate that you start writing soon. Uh, the, uh, writing is thinking. Writing is not just about the product of thinking. Writing is also the process of thinking. And you'll find that as you're writing and you're trying to sequence your thoughts in a clear and methodical way, for example, by outlining and noticing and designing the moves I described earlier, your thinking will sharpen too. So this is writing as an advanced, sophisticated skill as a scholar, not just putting marks on the page, start writing soon. I really recommend that. And here's a little template to get you thinking about it. That's it for today. I hope you found that session enjoyable and useful. See you next time.